Welcome to episode 12 of Back to Beverly, and thanks for tuning in. My next guest is an incredible entrepreneur who has built a cult-like following around the world for her athleisure brand since launching in 2017. She has been recognized by Forbes in their annual 30 Under 30 publication for the continued success of her brand and recently opened her first physical retail pop-up here in LA. There is so much to admire about her, but what I appreciated most in our interview was her willingness to be vulnerable about her high school years and what they meant to her. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, Beverly High is an incredible place, but means something different to everyone who has walked the halls. That said, here's my interview with Lindsay Carter, founder and CEO of Set Active. I hope you enjoy. We good to go in there? All right, cool. My next guest is the founder and CEO of a popular activewear brand that has gained a cult-like following since launching in 2017. Her brand is self-described as community first and a brand second, which has been key to their success as their customers often feel like stakeholders by providing feedback and helping with the continuous innovation and evolution of the brand. She was named to the 2021 Forbes 30 under 30 list in the retail and e-commerce category, and her clothes are worn by some of the most recognizable names in the world. She also recently launched her own podcast where she has thoughtful discussions with a variety of guests covering a wide range of topics. Please join me in welcoming the show, the founder and CEO of Set Active and Beverly High grad class of 2009, Lindsay Carter. Lindsay, thanks for coming on the show. Of course, happy to be here. How does it feel to be back on campus? Um, you know, feels a little triggering. <laughs> I did not love my high school experience, okay. um, but it is very nostalgic to be back. Yeah, I know we were chatting before the show about some of the changes that you noticed coming in, the different floors. Crazy. And, yeah. It looks so different. Um, well, you touched on it a little bit, but do you look back fondly on your Beverly experience? It sounds like maybe you don't. What were yeah. you involved in? Um, I mean, it definitely shaped me, I feel like, into who I am today in terms of like how I carry myself, how I treat others, um, and different things like that. I personally hated my high school experience. Okay. Um, I feel like I was socially bullied and just like not accepted for who I was and it just created a very hard experience for myself. Mm -hmm. But I had great outlets like soccer sure. and I was a football manager, I was baseball manager, I played volleyball, I did track, yeah. so the athletic side to Beverly kind of got me out of the hard yeah. days. Yeah, sure. Um, and I had some great teachers that I still talk to to this day. Nice. So, you know, it had it had its ups and downs. What, what, are, what are some of those names? I know some the listeners love to hear some of the... Okay, Beverly. I'm trying to think of who's still here. So, Mr. Marika, love mm -hmm. him forever. Yep. Um, Mr. Van Rossum, uh, Miss Brukeem, yeah. um, and Miss Newman. Nice. Uh, and then he's no longer here, but Dr. Stevenson, mm -hmm. um, OG, yeah. yes, I was in resource. Yes, he was my resource teacher. You can still be in resource and own, own a multi-million yeah. dollar company. Yeah. Um, I love I love it. It's it's funny that all these years later, you can still recall the names of your, I mean, your favorite teachers. Right? I'm obsessed with them. Yeah. And my sister's a teacher in, the, in BHUSD, actually. Oh, wow. That's so awesome. I get to like still stay in touch with a lot of them. Very cool. Yeah. So I've been listening to your podcast, and I know you talked about it, I think, on an episode with Payman, maybe. But you were back here a few years ago during Career Day, presenting with other entrepreneurs yes. um, in the clothing brand space. What was that like being on the other side, having sat through Career Days here as a student? Um, crazy. I mean, when I did Career Day at Set Active, I mean, at Set Active, I'm so used to saying Set Active. <laughs> when I did Career Day at Beverly, yep. I was like, I want to go into events. And like, I picked the craziest businesses. Mm -hmm. I will say that I remember the one of the founders, the husband of um, Candace Nelson, who they started Sprinkles, right. he came to speak at okay. my career day and he was telling us a story of how Sprinkles got started, Sprinkles Cupcakes. And I remember be, like thinking to myself, like, that's so cool like to be an entrepreneur and like how he started. He's, yeah. They started making cupcakes in his kitchen. Right. Um, and then speaking at career day, it's just been... It, it's crazy. It's motivating, and I know a lot of students still email me f who were in my speaker class oh, nice. to like listen to my, what I had to say, and yeah. um, I love it. Cool. Yeah. Um, so after Beverly, you, you graduate, you go to University of Arizona, where you spend your undergrad years. Mm -hmm. um, Arizona was a popular destination for Beverly grads at the time. Did it feel like high school all over again, or were you sort of able to chart your own path, make your own friends, while still also seeing some familiar faces around campus? No, 
I, once I graduated, I was like, bye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did not want anything to do with anything from this school. And um, I just did my own thing, sure. met my own friends. And I actually only went for a semester, came back to mm -hmm. LA mm -hmm. because I just, partied a little too mm. hard as mo as a fresh as freshmen do yeah, yeah. and um, I just didn't think that that was the best trajectory for me myself sure so I called my dad and I was like I need to come home I yeah. need to like think about some things and um, I kept up with classes at SMC okay then I went back and got my degree at U of A and finished nice. Nice. and that's where I met my now husband yeah. um, who I'm now pregnant with our second child oh. and got my degree at U of A. It's a pretty, that's a pretty mature decision for an 18 year old to make to be like, hey, I'm sort of like a little out of control right now. I need to like take a step back and regroup. <sighs> yeah, I'm, th one of the things I love about myself is how self-aware I am. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I always say this to all my employees at my company, but I think the best thing you can do for yourself is advocate. And there's nothing wrong with advocating for yourself because it educates others on your thoughts, your feelings, yeah. why you are the way you are, and I just, what was the worst that could happen? I sure. think my dad was gonna respect me more for telling him I need to come home, rather than play this dance of let me party, get drunk, right. not go to class, yeah. have him find out that I'm failing, and mm -hmm. I mean, the list goes on. Right, and have it be so, way worse down the road. Correct. Um, one of my big things is I, I think everything happens for a reason and maybe that was what you were meant to do and then you were meant to go back and meet your husband, right? And now you have this beautiful life with him. So totally seems like everything worked out there. So what was your post-college plan then? I mean, was there any inkling when you graduated that you wanted to start a business or did you start in the corporate world and say, I've had enough of this and I want to like my entrepreneurial spirits driving me? So I think I've known from a young age that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, not that I knew those words, I want to be an entrepreneur. Sure. I was always a self-starter <laughs> from, I think, 10 years old. I was yeah. rolling up pieces of paper and putting them in my neighbor's you know, door handle saying like, mother's helper, $8 an hour, stuff like that. Yeah. So then I, I think my dad caught on that I was a self-starter because I started to do other things mm -hmm. that like, he's like, how'd she think of that? Or like, how'd she, I always found a way to get what I wanted. Yeah. And he was so confused how I was always able to get what I wanted, but it's because I just never stopped until I got it. Um, persistence. Persistence yeah. is key. It's yeah. how you got me on your podcast. Right. Um, <laughs> three, and three or four emails later. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know what? No, I went to school to get an education degree. I wanted to be a kindergarten teacher. Yeah. Okay. And I felt so lost. I felt very forced to pick a major because mm -hmm. your first day at orientation, you see all these people picking their majors and then you kind of feel like you don't fit in if you don't know what you want to do. So right. instead of going the general route, I was like, well, I love kids. I want to be in education. So I did that and I am not a teacher. Mm -hmm. Never was, yeah. never even got my certifications. Mm -hmm. um, and it took, I mean, it was a journey to get yeah. to where I am now for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, walk, walk me through what, the thought process and what and, and and how much what was going through your brain when you decided to sort of walk away from a job or a steady paycheck, which I imagine you had, to say, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to roll the dice and I'm going to start set. So I actually started a company before I started set called LA Social. It okay. was a social media marketing company because mm -hmm. I I quickly found out that after college I got a job at NBC Universal. I felt it was right when social media, like not very many people were utilizing it for marketing reasons. Mm -hmm. They were just utilizing it kind of like how people are utilizing Be Real right now, like sure. for their own pleasure. Yep. And I saw the avenue of marketing something and that's when I kind of fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. So I started to really pour a lot of my energy into social media marketing and how to grow a cult-like following and all that stuff. Um, and so I decided to take my knowledge from that and start a, an agency where I did it for brands and celebrities and people like that. Yeah. And then I realized I didn't like giving other people my ideas and having them make money off of it. Sure. So, build their platform, build their yeah. brand for them, yeah. So I was like, you know what, what am I doing? I need to do yeah. this for myself. Yeah. Um, it wasn't easy. I, I racked up $20,000 credit card debt yeah. um, to start the company and uh, I'm no longer in debt. Mm. Uh, and it's great. <laughs> what, um, 
obviously that's a huge life change and you're, you're betting on yourself. Um, what were some of the challenges and how much self-discipline did it take for you to say, okay, now I have to schedule my days, right? Like this is, this is it's on me now. Um, honestly, I think it was just not an option to not do it. Mm -hmm. So I just, I did it. Like if, if people were getting up for a nine to five, I was yep. getting up for a nine to five. Got it. And I was filling those hours with things that could push my business forward. Mm -hmm. um, I quickly learned that when you're an entrepreneur, nine to five does not exist. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was a big wake up call for me, but yeah. I was happy to do it because I thrive in chaos personally. Everyone's like, you never slow down. Or I was just talking to my doula before coming here cause I'm about to give birth to my second child. And she was like, you just keep going. Nonstop. But it's, it's because that's where I thrive the best. Yeah. And I know that about myself. And I imagine if it's something that you love, I mean, this like live and breathe, that it doesn't really feel much like work, right? It, it does not feel yeah. like work. Of yeah. course, there are hard days. There are days where I have to fire someone. Sure. There's days where someone quits and you have to like manage all these different personalities in an office space. Um, and then production doesn't work. And there are days where I literally want to pull my hair out. Yeah. But most days I am, I wake up and I'm like, I cannot believe this is my job. Yeah. Um, so, so deep diving a little deeper into set. So athleisure and activewear has obviously grown exponentially as a category over the last few years. How did you ultimately determine that activewear had a space, uh, had space in a world with so many well-known and established brands? And did you see something in there that set would provide? Yes. So at the time that I started set, um, now five years ago. Well, I actually technically five and a half years ago because the idea to execution took about a year. Okay. So at that time, there wasn't really a D2C, direct to consumer mm -hmm. brand yeah. who was doing athleisure. 100%. And if they were, it was kind of wonky. I was mm -hmm. like, what the hell is that? Well, it was so the, the category was more of an in-store retail experience. Yes. Okay. So like you had your Lululemon, right. you had Aloe, but it was Back then, aloe was branded as aloe yoga, mm, and it was right. yoga poses and things you can do with yoga clothes, mm -hmm. and it was not what it's trying to be now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I saw in the market that there wasn't a direct-to-consumer, meaning sold online, athleisure market that sold cute functional clothes that simplified the way that you got dressed. Mm -hmm. And I have no background in fashion or design, yeah. but I did learn yesterday from my head of production that I'm a dilettante. Oh. Do you know what that is? I don't. Please I had to me. I had to Google what that means okay. because I also didn't know what it yeah. meant. When I Googled it, yeah. it was a physics word and I was okay. like, this makes no sense. Yeah. He's like, you, you spelled it wrong. Yeah. I was like, okay, cool. Love that. Um, it means when you have an eye for something with no prior experience or knowledge. Oh, interesting. Um, and so I, I feel validated every day um, with how decisive I am decisive I am in yeah. the business that I know what I'm doing. Do you think that not having a background in the space has benefited you at all? Like looking at it with a fresh set of eyes? Um, yes and no. I mean, it's, you'll, you learn once you're in this world mm -hmm. that everyone gets inspired by everyone. It's how do you put your stamp on it to make it different, both in the marketing avenue and yeah. in the product avenue. Got it. And, um, that's just what I do every day. Yeah. So you notice there was a there wasn't there was room, and then you talked about a year from when you had the idea to sort of launch. Mm -hmm. In that, did, did you have a mentor and advisor in that time that you talked to that you would workshop with? Did you talk to other designers and people in the space, or was it sort of like it's just the Lindsay show for that year until you launched, and then? I didn't talk to other designers. I honestly didn't even talk to other business owners. I kind of mm -hmm. wanted to like figure it out on my own. Mm -hmm. I did talk to people in production Got it. because I knew I wanted to start with seamless activewear, which is made tubular with mm -hmm. no seams. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't think that there was anyone doing that style mm -hmm. like well. So I wanted to start there, which took a lot of research. For the first seven months, I worked with this one guy who kept like telling me like, yeah, samples are coming, samples are coming. They never showed up. Yeah. I'm like, 
was just yanking your chain or I, I mean I'm gonna call him John for yeah. intensive purposes I yeah. won't say his name sure. but I'm like John what the f yeah. sorry am I allowed to say that oh <laughs> we'll my god <laughs> we'll bleep it out <laughs> yeah bleep that sorry yeah, in post <laughs> on, my, on my podcast I do a lot yeah. of that. <laughs> woo I'm Bob Beverly <laughs> <laughs> have to remember that um no so sorry back yeah. up yeah. rewind um I would say, John, like, what's going on here? Right. I like, it's been seven months and I have no samples and you keep yeah. promising and promising. So I had to like, be like, I can't wait on this guy. I gotta yeah. switch gears. Yeah. So I switched gears and ended up talking to this other guy who became my production partner. Um, and he had the technical side of production mm -hmm. under his belt and we were able to go from there. Nice. Um, can you talk a little bit about what or how you stay relevant and how you continue to stay relevant and evolve in such a competitive market and what sets your brand apart, no pun intended. So I think for set, in terms of what's setting us apart is that we're always staying true to who we are at the mm -hmm. core. We're never, mm -hmm. we're never shifting what our core values are when the world is shifting. So mm -hmm. we're always simplifying the way that you get dressed. I'm not yeah. gonna go out and add, you know, just because leather is in. I'm not gonna go add leather trim sure. to my leggings because that's what is Just in right that's now. that's the way the leaves fall. Yeah. yeah. Um, however, there are ways to elevate what you're doing and still keep up with the times. Mm -hmm. I, it's the best piece of advice that I've ever read. It wasn't given to me, and you guys might laugh, but it's from Kim Kardashian, and mm -hmm. it's putting your blinders on. You have to pretend you're in a horse race and you have to put your blinders on and you just have to keep moving forward. You yeah. can't look left, you can't look right. You gotta focus on why you're doing what you're doing mm -hmm. and everything else will follow. Yeah, interesting, it's a good piece of advice. Um, so Set has developed, and I mentioned in the opening, a, a, a cult-like community following. Do you think that the influencers and in your use of product gifting has played a role in attracting a lo such a loyal customer base? And what are some of the other marketing or promotion strategies that you've employed to gain such a great market share? So yeah, first, influencer marketing was huge. I was very lucky that, you know, I kind of went a route of no strings attached. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sending out direct messages on Instagram saying, like, hey Dylan, I want to send you something. I can offer you $500 for a post. Yeah. Or, hey Dylan, I want to send you something and then following up every five seconds. Did you get it? Did uh -huh. you post? Did yeah. you post? Sure. Do you like it? Did yeah. you post? I just was like, hey, I just started this company I don't even know if you're gonna see this message. Mm -hmm. I'd love to send it to you. Yeah. Send me your, eyes, your size and address and that's it. And I think once people started to get their product, they fell in love with the product, mm -hmm. they started asking for more and that's when I had leverage to be like, listen, I'm a brand new company, yeah. I'm happy to send you more but you have to post about it right. because I don't have the budget to pay you but you want more of my inventory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the landscape for influencer marketing is completely changing right now. Um, so that's what we're working on internally at Size. Like, how do you keep up with that landscape? Because they're demanding such large... It's just so saturated. Oh. Everyone's an influencer now. So you uh -huh. have to understand what type of influencer gives you that ROI. Yeah. Just because you have 5 million followers doesn't mean that that person's gonna convert to 300 new website visitors sure. buying your product. Right. But someone with 5,000 followers who has a loyal following uh -huh. in the middle of Utah, yeah. and people just love what this girl's doing, she's probably gonna send 1,000 people to your website. Right. So it all comes down to strategy. Does, and I, so strategies, I was gonna say, does that take a lot of research to identify like those niche influencers that might attract new set Customers. It's a lot of studying data. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of understanding who someone's audience is. So let's say you're a girl yeah. and you have 50,000 followers. I'm gonna go look at your page. Yeah. I've never heard of you before, but you have a following. Right. Are you someone I wanna send set to? I don't know. Let me look at your page. Mm -hmm. What are you wearing throughout your day? Mm -hmm. What's your daily life look like? What are people commenting on your Instagram post? If you're posting about rock, death metal music every yeah, day, right. Maybe you posting fit. set active is not going to send new right, followers right, right. to my page. However, market. if you're talking about your lifestyle on the go or like, you know, how much you love to work out mm -hmm. or your style or people like, where's your shirt from? Where are your shoes from? Right. I'm going to be a little bit more intrigued. Is, is that someone I want to send my product to? Interesting. Uh, and it makes perfect sense when you boil it down like that. Yeah. Um, so I've had some other a couple other folks that were in school when we were here, um, entrepreneurs like Celeste Derve and Payman Raff on the show, and they spoke about the need for founder and CEO to sort of know everything about their business. 
how many hats did you have to wear at the beginning and how many do you still wear to this day as the brand has grown and become more established? So you had to wear every hat in yeah. the beginning. You were the intern, you were the assistant, you were the head of operations, mm -hmm. you were the founder, you yeah. were the creative director, yeah. you were the social media manager, you were also the marketing manager, yeah. you did it all. Yeah. Um, but it's all about scale, right? Mm -hmm. It's how much can you do with all of that on your plate. Yeah. Um, I then hired an intern, and then I saw that I, we quickly needed an operations person. Um, now I'm still the CEO and creative director of SET, but I have relinquished a lot of control. Partly one, because I'm now gonna be a mom of two, and I need that time to yeah. spend with my kids, but also because you can't do it all. Right. And you have to understand, no matter how invested you are in your own company, that you can't do it all. Was, was that a hard realization to come to, that like, you, this is your baby, you did everything from the get-go, and now you're relinquishing certain roles to different people? Yeah. yeah. I'm sure it also feels a lot like letting your firstborn go away to college. It's right. like you've nurtured this thing for so long and uh -huh. now you're putting it into the hands of other people, right. let alone like letting the company like do its thing at the expense of other people's decisions. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of trust you have to let go of. Yeah. Um, but I guess when you get to that point, it means that the brand has become so successful that you need to focus your attention on everywhere. So I guess that's a, another way to look totally. at it. Totally. Yeah. And then you learn how hard it is to manage people's emotions and personality traits. Right. Yeah, that's internally. a whole other skill set. That is by far the hardest part of running a business. Yeah, is managing. Managing a team. team. I'm a recent, I, in my daily life, I'm managing a team of, I think, seven now, which is a decent size, and that's half of my day is spent managing. Um, and it's great, I, it's, I'm learning on the go, but it's um, more than I thought it would take. It's a lot. My yeah. assistant, every time we get in the elevator, I let out a big sigh at the yeah. end of the day, and he's like, what fires did you put out today? <laughs> I was like, where do I start? Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> so, Set recently dropped a popular New York City collection, which even garnered attention from my sis girlfriend's sister in Worcester, Mass, um, of all places. Um, I'm curious, do you dream up those designs or do you have a team internally that presents various production ideas to you for review, approval, and final okay? Um, both, but with the majority of me dreaming big. Mm. Um, I thought of this year's theme, which was, you know, a set was born and raised in LA and it means something differently across the US and so I wanted to create drops that were inspired by other places, cool. which is why there was New York, there yeah. was Miami, there was Montana, there was LA, mm -hmm. we, did, we did a bunch. Um, now we have a product designer, Haley, who's amazing, and she works cross-functionally with me and the marketing team and the brand team. Um, but everything we do at set tells a story. Mm -hmm. um, we don't just like drop a new bra and say, just dropped, yeah. new activewear bra. Right, like right. everything we do tells a story. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'd like to say I dream big in terms of what I want to do, but it's hard because that's not the way the fashion world works and how mm -hmm. we do things. Mm -hmm. My head of production reminds me of that every single day. But um, if you're going to work at set, it's my world and you guys are all just living in and it. I was so. just, it's been working, so <laughs> yeah. I think they better come board. Um, so I've asked this question a couple of times to other entrepreneurs and business owners that have been on the show, but... Do you carve out time in your day or week or month to think about the future of SET? And to that point, what are like the top goals or priorities over the next few years? Um, unsure if you're going to like my answer, but yeah. no. Okay. I don't like to plan five years ahead. Yep. So much can change in literally a month mm -hmm. that if I don't focus in the present as to where we are, of course I know what where we're headed. Yeah. Like I know our whole next year is planned out creatively and like in terms of production, mm -hmm. but in terms of like, where do you see set in five years? Yeah. I don't know, right. and I'm not gonna answer that. Mm -hmm. I, I, could not t I could not tell you where I see set. If yeah. you told me that I would have done flying six or seven people from my team to each location that we did this year to mm -hmm. shoot campaigns to reflect the yeah. city that we're dropping, mm -hmm. I would have told you you're crazy. I right. don't have the money to do that. Yeah. But here we are and we're doing it. So I really take what I have to deal with at hand, mm -hmm. of course, you know, with goals in the background, but um, I like to focus on the now. Yeah, looking back on the last five years, do you think that when you were launching the brand, you'd think you were gonna be where you are today? Yes and no. Um, if I put my mind to something, 
there is not one person who can tell me yeah. that I can't do it, and there's not one person who's going to get in my way. Mm-hmm. Um, so I knew that I was going to blow it up big, and if that meant selling my product on a street corner until yeah. I made my money back, I was going to do it. Sure. Um, I knew that I wanted to build a cult like following, and I felt it in my bones, and mm-hmm. I just didn't give myself another option. Interesting. You might have just answered this, but my next question is, what's, what is your greatest strength as a founder and CEO? And it might be that nothing's going to stop me mentality. I mean. Yeah, I would say that. Or I would say, you know, Gina, who also is a Beverly alumni, who I was just telling mm-hmm. you about. She's an incredible brand strategist who freelances for set. We were just chatting yesterday. I don't know how the question came up, but she was like, I think I figured out your like superpower as uh-huh. a CEO. Yeah. And I was like, cool, like, do you want to let me know? What, because what is like, it? Yeah. would love to know. <laughs> yeah. And she was like, you're, it's decisiveness. Like wow. you're so decisive. You know exactly what you want, how you're gonna get it, what, what it's gonna take. Yeah. What, even if it comes down to taking an inch flat off a strap of a bra in a sample fit meeting, I just know. Mm-hmm. And it's it's part of being a dilettante. Yeah. Um, However, I cannot choose if I want Chinese food or pizza for dinner. So I'm decisive right. professionally. Sure. I am not decisive. Well, hopefully your personally. husband steps in then at that point. Mm. No. Don't get me started there. <laughs> um, is there anything you don't like being the ultimate decision maker? Um, that's an interesting question. I don't think I've ever been asked that. Um, I think I love making the decisions because I do feel so confident in mm-hmm. the decisions that I make. Mm-hmm. But it is it is difficult sometimes. Yeah. Like when you're approving a development piece and this has to be final round, you can't help but ask because I'm like such a perfectionist. Yeah. I, can't, I can't help but ask myself like, should I move the straps over two more inches? Should uh-huh. I add another inch to the length? Yeah. Like I'd, it, that's the hard part. It's mm-hmm. like. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh shoot, yeah. I can't go back yeah. and I can't like that's the final decision. So it's 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 a catch twenty two for sure, but I think because of the confidence that I feel in my decision making mm-hmm. skills, mm-hmm. I kinda don't think twice about it. Yeah, okay, good. I was gonna ask if you ever second guess yourself, but it sounds like you make that decision and then you're It's on. very rare yeah. if I second guess myself. And if I do, I, I'll find a way to like try to feel what's in my gut. Yeah. I'll give you an example. We had to do an event for something. I can't, I'm not going to give too many details, but we had to do an event for something and I felt it in my gut that we should have canceled it. Mm -hmm. Um, For budget reasons, it didn't make sense. I didn't see the ROI, but my team pushed for it really hard. They're like, no, I really think that we should do it. it, You have to play that battle of like, listen to your team, but also like, do you listen to your gut? And so in this case, I listened to my team Mm -hmm. and it did exactly what I thought it was going to do. Mm. It failed. Mm. And I sh- that's when I'm like, I should have listened to my gut. Yeah. And that's what I like. I'm so good at listening to my gut, and usually my gut's always right. So if anyone's asking my yeah. advice, it's listen to your gut. Interesting. Well, I mean, I always look at everything as a learning lesson. So sometimes you have to, things have to fail, and you got to, you know. Yeah. Um, so as you look towards the future and, and the short-term future, not only does the brand continue to grow, but so does your family as you welcome your newest member very soon. What have you learned, or what have you learned as you navigate and balance running the business and also being a new mom? And is it hard to juggle both? I imagine it is. It's hard to juggle both in that mom guilt is real. Mm-hmm. You know, like I always ask myself, am I spending enough time with Ace? Am I present enough with him? Um, Set in a way is also my child, yeah. so it's like, if I'm with Ace and I'm like, <laughs> if I'm with Ace, I'm like, shoot, should I be back at work? Uh-huh. Like, it, it, does my team need me? Like, sure. sometimes I leave or I'll arrive at work after being home for the morning with Ace, and seven people are down my throat or down Jake's throat mm-hmm. saying, we need Lindsay, we need her, yeah. we need a meeting on the books, we need yeah. her approval on this, and yeah. it's just like, oh, should I have been here earlier? Right. Like, or it's it's always it's always going to be that game though. Yeah. You know what I mean? Is there a happy medium or is it just sort of like day by day? Um, No, I mean, I definitely set hard boundaries. Some days, of course, I have to stay past five, but Mm -hmm. I always tell my team I'm available by my phone. If you need me, text me, slack me, call me. I will, if I don't answer, I Mm -hmm. will answer. Yeah. Like within the same time period. 
Um, but I always leave the office at five and I always try to get home so that I can spend the rest of the evening with Ace and put him to sleep. Nice. And then I'm back online if I'm not falling asleep by 8 p.m. Wow, long days. Yeah. So I mentioned it in the opening, but you also recently launched a podcast, Ready, Set, Spill, uh, where you have discussions with guests covering a wide range of topics. How did that come about and what are so, some of the attributes that you look for in potential guests? So Ready, Set, Spill came about because, well, a couple a couple of reasons. Two, three years ago, I got a lot of requests on my personal Instagram to start a podcast. So I actually started a podcast from my dining room table called okay. Sorry For What. Okay. Um, and it was to stop saying sorry for things that you don't need to be sorry for. That was the whole idea because I feel like so many people just like, oh, sorry. Like, yeah. like they're just saying sorry when they don't need to be saying sorry. Yeah, right. Um, and so I started that podcast and I got like a thousand downloads an episode and I was wow. like, whoa, like I'm just doing this on my dining room yeah, table. Right. It's a ragtag operation. Um, I put that on hold because it is a lot of work mm -hmm. to host a podcast um, and I needed to focus on set. And then I was still getting all these requests for a podcast and I knew I needed to partner with someone because I couldn't do all the legwork. Dear, an opportunity happened with Dear Media. Cool. They put it um, up for me, and now I get thousands of downloads an episode. Yeah. And I really bring on people from motherhood to friends to business owners. Um, I would honestly bring on my dog if he could talk. <laughs> could I bring on anyone? Yeah. Um, but it's really just to like make things real. Mm -hmm. I post so much on my personal Instagram of like the days that I'm struggling, the days that I'm happy, when I have wins and losses. Yeah. And I think people just really enjoy seeing a real side to someone who's doing what I'm doing. Yeah. And that's sort of the idea, but in podcast form. Yeah, I've been listening and it's it's awesome because, so like for instance, I've listened to the episodes of Madeline Klein, Whitney Port, Sabina Ladha, who founded Doe, obviously Payman Chuck. I mean, I, I recommend everybody listen. And it's, it's interesting to hear from these people that you might see on the screen are, you know, are dealing with the same kind of stuff, yeah. right? And maybe you put them on a pedestal because you've watched them for so long, but they're really just having the same issues and the same problems. Everybody else. It's the same issues, it's yeah. the same problem, but it's also like, <laughs> I don't believe in gatekeeping. Yeah. And like, why am I gonna hold, there's room for everyone. Mm -hmm. And if you came to me and you're like, hey Linz, like I wanna start an activewear company for women, I'd be like, all right, let's sit down. I'll tell yeah. you where to start. Like, what's cool. the point in gatekeeping right. secrets? And yeah. so that's the other side to Ready, Set, Spill. Um, are you enjoying being behind the microphone? Yes, I mean, I'm not gonna lie. When you're eight months pregnant yeah. and a baby is sitting on every organ inside your body, <laughs> it's hard to talk. Sure. I'll like get out of breath yeah. and then I'll get a little dizzy yeah. and then I'll be like, wait, what was I saying? And mm -hmm. pregnancy brain is a real thing. So you forget like vocab words, like simple vocab words oh, that yeah. you would use in your everyday right life. Right when you need them, right? Right when you you're, need them. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, I, I do enjoy it. It's like therapy for me. Mm -hmm. And the stories that I hear and that I talk about on my podcast are, I leave every podcast being like, that was my favorite one. Right. But like, get, get better every time. I say it every time. Yeah. They're all my favorite. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's great. Now that you are the interviewee, how does it feel to be on the other side of the microphone? Uh, I also enjoy it. It's a nice yeah. break from yeah. hosting for sure. I've been on a couple podcasts. Um, I actually, I think that's also how my podcast came to life because I was on so many podcasts as oh, a guest mm -hmm. that those people started, they wanted the tables turned. They wanted more content. Um, <laughs> but I love, I love telling the story of set and I love, you know, motivating others to just go after what they want. So yeah. any opportunity I have to do that, I take it. Cool. You've experienced great success, obviously, with set and you're still so young. Are there any other dreams that are kicking around inside your head? at some point that you want to sort of go for? I always think about that question, you know, in terms of like what happens if set gets bought out. I hope that if set gets bought, I'm still a part of it in mm -hmm. some capacity mm -hmm. um, because I I did birth this company. Right. <laughs> um, but I don't know, maybe like consulting or I just, it's hard to think about because set is really what my focus is other yeah. than my family. Mm -hmm. So. Right now, it sets my future. To that point, have there have there already been requests or interest in buying set? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Okay. Totally. Yeah. I'm and, not there yet. Yeah, okay. They say the first five years of starting a company company is 
equivalent to one year of having a company. Oh, interesting. So it's we're still in infancy stage. Mm -hmm. We still have a lot to do. We're just scratching the surface. So yeah. I want to see what else I can do. Cool. Is there, would you say there's room in the activewear slash athleisure category for the next Lindsay Carter to start a brand? At totally. The, okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, listen, you can do anything you want. Yeah. Like if you came to me right now and you're like, I want to start a toilet paper company that has emojis all over it. Yeah. I'd be like, let's do it. Right. This is how you're going to do it. This yeah. is your marketing plan. This mm -hmm. is your social plan. It's especially with the social apps out there. Anything is possible. Yeah. Um, that's cool. I know it's, it sounds like the opportunities are endless if you sort of put your mind to it. Um, so obviously besides my podcast and yours, Ready, Sit, Spill, what are some of the other ones that you would recommend to someone listening maybe? Well, it depends what type of listener you are. Yeah. Um, if you're, if you want like something that just gets you to laugh and, you know, not super serious, mm -hmm. I would say the morning toast, very reality TV driven. Okay. Um, obviously the Skinny Confidential, mm -hmm. both Michael and Lauren um, co-host that show. They also are the ones behind Dear Media. Oh, interesting. Um, and and they just got their own smoothie at Air One. Uh, they did, yes. and their own cookie dough with dough. Oh, cool. Yes, um, cool. but the Skinny Confidential is really, really good. It covers every topic you can probably think of, yeah. so I like the the diversity of what they talk about. Got it. Um, and I really just love the I Love You So Much podcast. She's, I think, one of the first podcasts I was ever on. Mm -hmm. And it's all about, I'm 31, but she talks about all about navigating your 20s. And I think it's really, really, really great content to listen to yeah. if you are someone who's navigating your 20s. Right. I know it's, I was listening to that episode you did recently with her and it was like, there's no roadmap, right? Just mm -hmm. like, enjoy it, make mistakes, like learn from them. And then your 30s, you'll figure out what you, what was meant to be. Listen, I love my 30s way more than my 20s, I'll yeah. tell you that. Uh, so we both like to end our episodes similar ways, but what is one piece of advice you've ever gotten or a piece of advice you would share with someone pursuing their entrepreneurial dream? Um, Maybe it's the blinders that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely Kim's advice, mm -hmm. but have your blinders on and that can go for anything if you're being bullied in school or people are saying mean things about you or passing judgment on anything that you're doing it's your life not theirs just keep moving forward that's yeah. what i always say and honestly it's my biggest piece of advice is what i said on, on kenzie's podcast is there's no rule book to yeah. how you individually want to live your life of course your parents might set the path for you until you're out of their house but there is no rule book yeah. to how you want to live your life mm -hmm. and no one needs to tell you how to do that except for you. Yeah, it's it's good advice and I think I I wish I had seen known that at a younger age, right? Yeah. That like, you know, you just carve your own path. You also don't need to have everything figured out by the time you step foot on a college campus. True. And I feel like there's a lot of pressure to sort of have that figured out, right? It's like picking your major and what do you want to do after this? It's like you're 18 years old, you know, you don't know. Totally. Um, well, Lindsay, thank you so much for coming back to Beverly today. I really hope you enjoyed it. And one final thought from me is that the name Dylan works for both boys and girls. <laughs> it actually was on my list, yeah, so buddy. there you have it. Thanks again for listening. And just a reminder, if you enjoyed this interview, hit that subscribe button, leave me a review, and tell a friend. Today's Back to Beverly was recorded live in KBEV's Studio B on the campus of Beverly Hills High School under the supervision of media director and executive producer, Romeo Carey. Directed by Colby Gallardian, sound engineer, Jason Maybaugh, camera operator, Harry Gallardian, edited by Randy Curtis and produced by Dylan Curtis. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Back to Beverly on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube, and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Until next time, I'm your host, Dylan Curtis, signing off. Did you press record?